What's your biggest challenge in UX today? For some of us, it's, it's silos. We're in seriously siloed organizations. For others, it's, I feel like a bit of a running theme is just communicating our process and getting buy-in internally. For some of us, it's, uh, it's explaining to our friends and family what we do for a job. For, uh, um, but, but generally speaking, in the world of UX, the, the frame of this talk is around, oh, I should know this. <laughs> Um, the, the, the frame of this talk is actually around better understanding our users. And so we're going to be looking at the advertising era. And so to prepare for this, this talk, I went to the most credible and uh, reliable resource I could on the advertising era, um, <laughs> Mad Men. And I sat down and I, and I began to watch this. And uh, it was wonderful. Don Draper and his deep, soothing voice and these liquor-stocked offices and this eye-opening dose of sexism and cigarettes, and I was like, cool, what, how am I going to pull this into the world of UX? But there's actually, during the, 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 like the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the world, I mean, it's always changing, but, but, but during the advertising era, a lot of the communication world really came into its own. Due to manufacturing, due to a huge range of things, we went from a world where people basically became bombarded with options to buy stuff. It meant that you came out with an with a offering, and very quickly an organization would come out with a Me Too type offering. We went from a few options on an aisle and a shelf to, to hundreds of them. And uh, the, the world basically, yeah, it, it really was over-communicated, and there's a book that a lot of this talk is based on, which is Positioning by Al Rise and Jack Trout, and it came out in the 70s, in the early 70s, and they basically, one of the research things they quoted in it was that we now produce 30,000 <coughs> 30, books a year, and, that, and, and if we were to read those books, this is in the States, if we were to read those books, it would take us 17 years of reading at 24 hours a day. And they painted this picture that we're so over-communicated. And, so, and, and because of this, and because the marketplace became so uh, saturated, and even industries that didn't used to advertise, they were now advertising, um, some very smart people, uh, namely Al Rise and Jack Trout, at least they, they popularized this term positioning. And the idea behind it is that it's a framework to help uh, understand the human mind and the way the mind actually uh, perceives and actually retains information. And so over the next kind of, um, uh, I don't know how long this talk is, 20, 25 minutes, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, brand positioning, like what is it, why do we need it in UX, and how do we do it, okay? So brand positioning, what, what is it and, and why do we need it in UX? Uh, and how do we do it? Um, is that? Yeah, that helps me. So if Jack, if, if back in the 70s they thought they lived in an over-communicated society, uh, like, I, I did like a little bit of homework on this and uh, this just kind of blew my mind because basically, what they produced in a year, depending on how you review data, we now produce more than that in a day. Uh, Netflix, every 60 seconds, there are 700,000 hours of Netflix watched. That means by the time this talk's finished, 21 million hours of Netflix will have been watched. There's 188 million emails sent every 60 seconds. I was just like, if we, we live in an over-communicated society, and so I, I, I want to paint that picture. And so when we think about what is positioning, it's still just as relevant today because it's a framework for understanding the human mind. And as UX is, the goal of all UX is the human mind. And I guess this, this really is like the core concept to understanding positioning, and that's that your user's perception is reality. It's their reality, but therefore for them it's it's reality. Now let me, let me just break down some of the fundamentals of uh, positioning. So there's two things to understand here. With this over-communicated society, there's a couple of things that the brain does to deal with this. The first thing the brain does is it blocks things off. We literally get to a point where we cannot, li literally cannot, take in any more information. I don't know if you can relate to this personally, but like you're looking for something and it's like a pen or something and it's right in front of you on your desk 
and you're like, I just can't find it. And you're like, has anyone seen my pen? And they're like, it's, it's right here. And you're like, oh, I'm sorry, due to overstimulus, my brain is actually no longer taking in information at this point. <laughs> so th this is one of the very real things. And as UX is, this is a big problem. That means all your work, all your design, all your research, then literally not even going to be able to see it. Uh, we were user testing with Wellington Airport. This is when I was an agency called Springload. And we had just uh, designed a version of the website. We sit down with the user and we go, okay, how would you go about um, uh, uh, understanding or booking a car park? Uh, and we've literally got this widget, this bright yellow widget labeled parking. And they even moused over it. And they were like, um, uh, I don't know where I'd go. And, and, and the thing is, because in that mind of that person doing that user test, they had, in their, they had thought they wouldn't put a banner. They'd already preconceived in their mind that, that that widget would not exist. So while we designed it, while we put it there, it, it didn't actually matter because they thought they would have to go to a different page to find that. And so this is a very simple concept, but your user's perception is reality. So the, the, the second main thing that, that the human brain does to understand information is we categorize it. I like to think of the human brain a little bit like a computer, and yes, I'm going to oversimplify this, but when communication is actually received and we're in a, and we're in a position, the door's not shut, there's actually an option for the information to come in, we take that information and we break it down into a category and we slot it into our brain like RAM, like, like, RAM, like random access memory, just so one day we can, we can potentially go and gather that. So, this, I really don't want you to miss this, that your user's perception is reality. I was thinking, there, was, there are so many ways to illustrate this, but for me, um, I really like red wine, like I love a nice glass of wine. And if, if someone literally took a cheap wine, poured it into a vintage bottle without me seeing, and then they were to carefully decant it in front of me and present me with this glass of wine, I would literally, I'd, I'd taste it and I'd go, mmm, ooh, <laughs> interesting. My, and, and, I'd, and the crazy thing, it would literally taste better. That's what's so crazy about this whole setup is, is I, I would, even though it's a cheaper wine, I'd be like, hmm, tangy. Ooh, <laughs> how delicate. You know, I, I'd be really, that, that's the thing, because perception is reality. Or like I really, I, um, for some reason, I wanted to buy a Jeep Wrangler. I thought they were cool. So I did some homework on them. And it was like, these cars are expensive. They break down, they're loud, they're noisy, they are terribly inefficient, but we love them. People drive all around the world to, to meet up, to talk about their Wranglers because they love them. To them, to those people, their perception, that's their reality. They love it. And this is, uh, this is probably much the, the main point of the talk is that your user's perception is your reality. The second, the second fundamental for, Prince for, for, for positioning that I want you to understand uh, is that when we take that information, is that we, when the information is actually received, and we categorize it, is kind of like we started to talk about this. This is a really common one in UX, especially if you're doing information architecture or taxonomy or um, navigation, etc. cetera. Um, George Miller in the 50s, I believe, actually came up with Miller's Law, which is, again, it's a really common thing here. Lists five, uh, seven, plus or minus two. Let me just illustrate this quickly. If you were to think of uh, shoe brands, how many shoe brands can you think of? Right now in the room, through your brain, you're going, okay, I want the list of shoes, and I'm gonna come up, and for many of you, you'll be able to come up with somewhere between mm, five to nine on average, for, d depending on how hard you really think. That's almost like positioning working. For me, another really good example uh, is, who here's from Wellington? Great. So if I go to you and I'm like, hey, where should I go for dinner tonight that's cheap and cheerful? <laughs> McDonald's owns the cheap and cheerful position in your mind. That's, that, 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 that's how the brain works. And the idea of positioning is that you want to find a gap, a window in the mind that is not already owned by something else. And that's because while there's, there's lists and that kind of thing, a core principle of positioning is that you need to be first. Because again, because it's in such an oversaturated uh, world, and I'm gonna talk about that in a, in a little bit more. But that brings me to the, to the big question, which is 
how do people position your organization? Not what you think, not, not, not what your marketing team thinks, but actually in the mind of your user, what position does your organization hold right now? Because as we've worked out, that position that your organization holds, that frames everything. Because if they perceive your organization to be hard to deal with, guess how your UX is gonna be perceived? Hard to deal with. Even though you're working so hard to do it, really, you might actually have more of a positioning problem. If you're working for inland revenue and a, the, the segment that you're working with does not want to pay tax, you can streamline that all you want, but you're going to have a lot of people avoiding you. And actually, the reality is, is you, to, to start to work to push out, and, and this is almost a little bit where we're heading, is when you do your journey mapping, when you understand the context, pushing out even further to understand your market context, to understand the actual framing of where they're even coming from. They might not have even heard of your app and they'll, or, or whatever your organization is, and even if they've never even used it, they're going to take something relative in their mind and go, it's probably gonna be like this. Their expectations are already somewhat set before they even engage with you, and as you, and, and I wanna challenge you as UXs, is to understand that because I because to kind of answer the question of why brand well why positioning for UX is because we know people. We're the ones that get people. We've got the tools and the processes and the systems to understand people better than anyone else. And I want to see us as UXs leading the organization to better empathize with them. And I believe this is not necessarily a tool for everybody, but positioning is a tool that for some of you, this is, a, this is your one. This is a key takeaway from the conference of, hey, we actually need to think wider about the context because we're kind of micro-optimizing our UX without understanding the actual position our entire experience fits in the mind of our user. So, still with me? Great response. Still with me? <laughs> there we go. We have, um, so we've kind of looked at a little bit of like, what is positioning? It's, a, it's finding a gap. It's finding a window in the mind. Uh, and now we're going to, um, and we're kind of, I'm trying to drip it in the whole way to keep you engaged, that um, this is relevant for UX. Um, and so, how, but, but I want to start moving into how do we, how do, we do positioning, because I think this will also help us better understand the, the concept. The primary, th I, I want you to understand this, that the idea here is to be first. Let me give you some simple illustrations. Who was the first person to walk on the moon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was the second? What? Oh man, I didn't even know that. Okay, this is this is this is my illustration. Okay, who was the first person to climb Mount Everest? Who was the second? Oh man, this is a way this is a way too smart an audience. <laughs> that just backfired so badly. I um Okay, let <laughs> Let, let me give you an illustration from the advertising era. Coca-Cola. It's a, a fizzy pop drink giant, and they didn't like it that a brand called Dr. Pepper was uh, taking up a portion of their market. In fact, it kind of had their own market. So Coke, with all of their resources, is the biggest um, beverage company in the world, engaged some of the best agencies, and I'm sure they went through a wonderful strategic process to, to design things, to, um, to label it, and they, they basically they came up with this brand to compete with Dr. Pepper. So Dr. Pepper's like an aniseed-flavored beverage, and Coke comes out, and they say, we, they, I'm sure they went through this great process, and they came up with this drink called Mr. Pib. They said, we want to take on Dr. Pepper, and so they went through this big hoorah with all their distribution and all their expertise, and they launched into Dr. Pepper's market with a big fail. And the reason being, and the reason they could only take a small portion of Dr. Pepper's market share is because in the mind of the consumer, when you want that delicious, cold, sweet, aniseed beverage, Dr. Pepper comes to mind. Not Mr. Pibb, and even though all that research was great, and even though the name is even kind of ripping off Dr. Pepper, it's, uh, the idea here is that you've got to be first. When it comes to positioning, it's about finding a blank window in the mind. One of the, um, in the advertising world, one of the greatest ad campaigns 
that some people refer to um, was by Volkswagen. And uh, this, was, this came out in the 50s, and there was, uh, this is when the car market was all about big, all about the big Chevy and the big Cadillac and luxury and bigger is more. And so Volkswagen comes out with think small. But what I want you to note here, that seems real obvious, they zigged, so we zagged, but it's actually more than that, because it's actually, these people are really clever with understanding positioning and this concept of actually where things sit in the mind of the consumer. And this here is actually a positioning statement. They're actually, this, they just put it in a campaign. They said, instead of thinking big, because right now that's where everyone is saying, we actually want you to think differently. Think small. Bigger is not better. And this, this campaign literally, uh, I mean, the whole car was just kind of the polar opposite. And I love it that it pulled the world into, no, bigger engines, bigger everything. It's not actually better. Think small. And this is a, a, a brand with hopefully a bit of a meaning and a bit of a story. And hopefully we get to work with organizations that have a bit of a meaning and a bit of a story. And we get to go, let's find a position in the mind of our consumers and let's be first. Um, there was a whole stream of ads here. Volkswagen doesn't do it again. They even likened their car to a like a cockroach, like it can't be killed. Like it's, it's. They, they said, no, you can't fit basketball players in our car. That's not what we're trying to do. Think small. Um, the, uh, I guess another way that I think about positioning is a little bit like marriage. You you don't necessarily have to be the best. You just have to be first and not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not give them a reason to leave. That's, <laughs> so so that, that's the idea, because once you hold that position in the mind, you've, you've got it. You're, you're first. And, and I want to keep pulling you back to this idea that your user's perception is reality. And the entire idea behind this is that in order for your, your organization to be sitting in the mind of your user, that's where this, all of this takes place. Um, so, I've got a note here which is about how positioning steers UX decisions. Because as an organization, again, I want to pull you into the macro here. This is the goal of this talk, is to help you think more strategically. You have an organization that is going somewhere, and one of the big struggles we have as UX is, is getting by and is actually aligning internally with the organization to follow our processes. But this is one way we can actually push out and actually call our organization to be more strategic because from our actual, from our actual people, our actual customers, this is where their world is. It's actually that context, and if we can help pull this in. This is going to be incredibly powerful. And so the other thing is that if your organization is aligned on your position, this should inform the decisions that you make as a UX and UI designer. Even And so as a UX researcher, you may be more helping inform this conversation. But this should also help give you context. This should help you understand more biases. This should pull you into, uh, hopefully, a, a slightly newer frame of thinking. And so this is a really common thing. Hey, let's just build the same thing as someone else, but better. So many times that will not work, and instead of trying to chase what someone else is doing, you should be doing actual problem discovery, actually understanding your users and how they think about their world and what they're trying to do, and actually design a real experience that's going to solve the problem and not just compete and try and do something better. So, how to... Uh, position your organization. I, I, didn't, I, I intentionally, I don't want to spend too long here because you're all the practitioners. There's, um, but what I did want to note here that I really enjoyed, and this is something we're starting to do a little bit of at Data Story, was a thing called a semantic differential. Again, a, a research technique developed during the advertising era. And the idea of a, who here knows what a semantic differential is? Yeah, one person. Great. <laughs> um, so, um, the idea of a semantic differential is that it's a type, type of research, basically, to compare emotions uh, and things. It's a, it's a little bit of a, Kelsey might tell me off later, it's a little bit of a, a blend between qualitative and quantitative. Here's an example I found off Google, and this here was comparing buses in Poland. And the idea here is you can start to see, the idea here is that you're mapping your competition. 
You're mapping the market and you're mapping the mind of your user. And again, there's probably a lot of research to even do and conversations to even have to understand their language. But the, but the whole point of this is that it's not what you think. It's about the mind of your user because your user's perception is reality, and again, this is, I, again, I don't feel like I need to talk too much about good research design. You need to be able to segment this data by your users, by, um, by as in like, are they heavy users, are they light users, by certain demographics, by certain life events. Again, it's all so contextual as to how you design good research, but I want you to pull, but again, the core, think macro, think strategically, how can your UX tie into your wider organization's goal? So, um, this slide here is a, like a sales type um, process that I actually kind of want to skip over. There's only one thing I want you to get, and that is your user's perception is your reality. Because if they don't first understand what you do and why you do it, providing clearer, providing clearer better design, better, et cetera, is not actually going to help. And it's got to start with this, with this space. If they've got to basically first understand what it is that you do and why you do it. So I want to, uh, at Data Story, we do a lot, of, a lot of journey mapping. The reason being is pretty much I just find it one of the greatest ways to pull in empathy and to pull in context. And so this here is a journey map we're doing for Kadrona, the ski field, that we're in the process of. This is a tool called Miro. I don't know, it's like a collaboration tool. We use lots of them. But the idea of this is this is one product for one, for kind of just one user type. But what we're actually looking at here is this, each of these little stickies are key data points, but what I want you to pull here is we've actually mapped the competition and we've actually mapped people in other industries as well. So again, we're trying to frame the wider context in our journey mapping. We're actually trying to push out for this particular audience, for this particular product, to actually get, um, to, to, to get wider context. Um, I love the, the thought of, like know where you play. As a UXer, you've got this, the, the best tool belt in the world to better understand people. And you need to know what tool to use, when, and how to use it. And I wanna just, well, the reason I didn't wanna go into too much detail here is I wanna just challenge you. Be strategic, design smarter research. Design the, the right research that your organization needs to tell a better story, to actually understand the mind of your user. Uh, what I want to do now is finish with a story, a story to wrap it up, um, just to kind of sum things up. There's a guy, Craig Rochelle, and he was at a barbecue uh, with his family, and a guy went up to him and said, I bet you can't hold your breath for a minute. And he's a competitive guy, so he says, all right, well, game on. And so they go over to the pool, and, he, and they're going to use the pool for the test, and he says, all right. Well, he gets his stopwatch out, and goes, on your marks, gets it, going, goes, <gasps> head in the pool. Ten seconds, you're doing good, Craig. You can do it. There's more in you. Gets to 30 seconds and he says his heart starts to feel really tight. I don't know if you know that feeling. And then you start to panic a bit and he starts doing this. And finally, 45, 50 seconds. Come on, you can do it, Craig. You can do it. 60 seconds and then, <gasps> yeah, I did it. And the dude's pumped. And then the guy says, right, with my, with my coaching and help, I think you can hold your breath for two minutes. Craig's like, no way, this is, this is impossible. And he, this, that's, that, you know, I was literally like thinking I was going to die. I'm kind of a bit lightheaded now. And, and, and he says, no, he explains, he says, look, I'm going to give you some techniques. This is what I do. I'm a coach. Let me help you out. So he explains to him, you need to expand your lungs. You need you know, all this burning oxygen. You need, to, you need to do none of that. So he holds his breath. So he, he expands his lungs, follows the coaching. Here we go. Time starts. You're doing good, Craig. Keep your heart rate calm. And then when, when he gets to about a minute, he says to Craig, he says, this is good. You're already like where you were. You're in such a better pace, place. And now, now that it's starting to get a bit hard, what I want you to do is I want you to let out a little bit of oxygen. Because what that's going to do is that's going to trick your brain into actually thinking you're about to get more oxygen. So he lets out a little bit of oxygen. He stays calm. He says, you're doing good, Craig. There's more in you. I believe in you, Craig. There's more in you. You're at a minute 45. You're so close, Craig. Just hang in there just a little bit longer. Sure enough, minute 55. Come on, Craig. I, I believe in you. You can do this. Two minutes. Craig comes out and he goes, I just did it. And he says, Craig, you just held your breath for two minutes and 45 seconds. <laughs> and, he says, and he says, what do you mean? He says, I lied to you about the time the whole time. <laughs> um, you see, what you've got to understand here 
is that your perception is your reality and that your mind doesn't know what you're capable of. And so there's two calls here. As, as, as UXers, I want to challenge you that you don't know what you're capable of. Push into your organizations, push wider, lead them to, to, to understand your users better than you can because the mind of your user or your user's perception is reality. Thank you.